topic of uh, secure ranging, then we formed this uh, startup company, which we now already in production called 3DB. Uh, actually, DB stands for distance bounding. It's a very known, I mean, it's a known concept in the academic literature in security. It starts back in 1993 in a seminal paper from Brands and Chow about distance bounding and different types of attacks. So yeah, DB actually, 3DB actually stands for that. So we have a very strong uh, academic background uh, and we are still having lots of research on that topic uh, together with uh, ETH in Zurich and also the Swiss Center of Microelectronics in, in Switzerland. So, um, so I'll, I'll try to give you a, a keynote on secure ranging applications. And, uh, and my goal is to actually make you understand what it is why it's important and give you a feeling of what it means to make secure ranging systems. So uh, I'll start with showing a real a live camera relay. Uh, and I will go into detail about what secure distance measurement is, uh, what are current deployments, more applications, and at the end I'll just tell a little bit about 3db. Uh, such that we know uh, who we are, what we do, and, and so on. So, but the main thing is really about um, secure ranging and applications. So, uh, relay attacks. I, I, I think I know that already in Bulgaria, such relay attacks are being done in Switzerland as well, actually all over Europe, US, uh, China. Uh, I didn't hear about Japan yet, but here uh, I'll just show you a video. Um, maybe I'll bit stop it here. So See what's happened. So I'll stop here. It actually took approximately uh, 30 to 40 seconds to steal this car from the house. And uh, and you're wondering, but how is that possible when an expensive car uh, has an um, uh, access control system and so on? This access control was able, we were able to compromise very, uh, very shortly. So uh, what is actually happening, I'll start again, is uh, from the beginning here, this person comes with this uh, big loop antenna, which is here in his hands, and he's able to um, excite the key fob, which is inside the, the house somewhere, but actually the range of this uh, of of wireless communication, and may it's actually several tens of meters. So it's able to uh, excite the key, make the key believe that the key is close to the car, and then there is another person inside the car who uh, would just, uh, the, I mean, the key fob would send the signal to the car saying, oh, please open. And then also please start. And then the person just, the, the second person goes, initiates all that and the car leaves without any knowledge of the owner that his car disappears. And this takes a very short period of time. So what actually happened? Uh, Conventional, actually current car, car access systems, the, one, the ones that are on the market up to last year, they use two technologies in or two wireless technologies to establish whether the key fob is in proximity of the car or it's actually inside the car. It's important for the system to distinguish that you are outside the car such that you can open your door uh, when you are close by. And then it's very important for the system to detect that the key fob is really inside the car, such that um, uh, when you click the button, you can start and drive the car. And it relies on a LF technology, 120 to 135 kilohertz, uh, in order to do the localization around and uh, in And then typically the key fob replies back in a, a in a UHF signal with 315, 433 megahertz, which is a long range technology, typically over 
100 meters. And then, but you tell me why it's short range. The LS signal is, is done in such a way that it cannot be heard if the key fob is, is outside two meters uh, from the car. And actually, how the attackers, what the attackers did is uh, what we call an analog signal relay attack. So they were able to relay the signal from the car to the key fob, even if the key fob is uh, tens of meters away from the car. And actually the attack works even the key fob is 50, 60 meters away from the, from the car. So it's, it's actually um, a very fast analog uh, using only amplification uh, setups to amplify the signal from the car such that instead of uh, the car sending the signal only two meters with special setup, you're able to um, forward the signal further 50 meters away. And then the key fob hears this and oh, I, I heard the signal from the car, so I must be close to the car. And therefore it gives instructions, please open to the car. And this is how actually these systems are being exploited. And it takes uh, tens of, of seconds to do the whole setup and leave with the car, okay? So that's actually, uh, the attack and what is the fundamental problem? The fundamental problem is that the car is not actually making any distance measurements. It is just, if it hears the signal, the LS signal, if the key fob hears the signal from the car, it says, oh, I'm there and I allow to open. So there is no, these systems are deeply not secure. They're really based on radio signal strength. Okay, so now, how can we secure that, right? So we need really secure ranging, which needs to be provable, secure against all logical and physical layer attacks. Uh, uh, security should not depend on the context or attacker capabilities, and therefore it can be used for a wider range of applications. So uh, it's, it's really important that actually the car and the key fob, they do uh, round trip time of flight based on the speed of light in order to establish security that the distance is, let's say 50 centimeters, one meter, two meters, five meters, 10 and so on. And this should not be attackable by any physical or logical means. So now you can tell me, but how do we do that? There are different ways of measuring distance. And here I want to mention several of these. So you have, for example, uh, RSSI measurement, maybe most of the people here are aware of that. Uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, different standards actually use this kind of concepts. And this is not secure because it just relies on uh, the strength of the signal, which can be easily compromised by an attacker. Then you have other concepts like multi-carrier measurement used in some other devices. This is also not secure. There are frequency modulated continuous waves, they're not also not secure. And uh, here we go towards another set of ranging measurement techniques, which is based on uh, radio frequency distance measurement, like chirp spread spectrums, ultra wideband, uh, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, 5G, and so on. Some of them have proven, even if they can measure the distance, they're proven to be not secure because of physical layer vulnerabilities. This is the chirp spread spectrum technique. And some others like ultra wideband on which I will focus uh, from the remaining part of the code actually can provide provably secure ranging in certain modes. And, uh, and actually this is the first standard uh, 154Z which was released last year, which is the first secure ranging standard based on ultra wideband signaling. And there are also in the literature and in the public domain, other efforts to make secure ranging. Things are like in Wi-Fi domain, uh, 802.11 AZ, next generation positioning. They, they're putting some effort to, to do secure ranging as well. And there will be soon first academic proposals towards secure ranging for 5G systems, okay? But from now on, I will focus on uh, secure ranging uh, from logical layer and then from signaling layer using ultra wideband technology. So how do we do secure ranging? In general, there's a set of literature, academic literature since 93, which is referred as distance bounding protocols. What is a distance bounding protocol? Uh, uh, it has what we call a 
uh, a verifier. So this is typically, for example, the car. The car wants to verify that the key fob, which is a prover, is close by. And this verifier would have sent the random challenge, what we call here uh, NNV. It's typically random challenge of, let's say, 32 bits or 64 bits, depending on the level of security. The prover would have to process that in a fixed reply time with, with fixed processing time that the verifier knows, sends it back, and the verifier measures the time of flight in really sub nanosecond precision to be able to really prove the distance with a centimeter precision uh, to the, with respect to the prover. And the most common attack is you have uh, the attacker who try to manipulate this process, okay? So uh, that's from logical point of view, it's a challenge response protocol. You send the challenge, which is not known to the attacker from logical point of view. There is a response also, which is also known to, not known to the attacker and you establish uh, the distance between the two, the two devices. Now, it turns out that on a logical layer, it's, uh, we can secure that we have conventional means of uh, generating random challenges, of authenticating them, encrypting them, and so on. But uh, if you don't have the appropriate physical layer of transmitting and receiving these challenges, this actually can be compromised. And it turns out that uh, ultra-wideband signaling uh, provides a provably secure ranging on the physical layer. And here I will try to first give a little bit of intuition and then go a little bit in more detail. Uh, the reason for that provable security possible is that ultra wideband encodes a bit, a logical bit, zero and one in terms of pulses. And these pulses, uh, in order to be able to accurately measure the distance, they're very, very short. We typically, in the, we talk about two to three nanoseconds is such a pulse that you see here. And the two nanosecond pulse corresponds to 60 centimeters distance in terms of, uh, in terms of um, uh, speed of light, okay? So the total symbol of one bit, one or zero being sent is actually very, very short. And of course, there are also schemes where you have to encode data with more pulses. For example, here I, I show an example of a bit being encoded with four pulses and a bit zero with four negative pulses, for example. So these systems also can be probably secure. And there is uh, several papers who discuss how to do that. But first I will focus to present you why a physical layer with, a, with single pulses is actually theoretically secure to give you this intuition. And then uh, I leave you some references afterwards where you can, you can read about longer symbols, how we can actually secure multiples for bit, uh, for bit singles. So um, on that side, uh, it's, um, it's a little bit maybe too much information, but let's start step by step. Uh, we see here the person with the key fob, this is genuine situation. The car has sent its uh, random challenge. It's not shown here on the picture. And here we only see the response, which is the MP. It's the challenge of uh, a uh, message authentication code uh, of the challenge and some identity information. And then what happens is that uh, the, the car, it has sent its challenge uh, uh, signal and it started a stopwatch. And then it starts receiving the, the response. But the first part of the response is actually a preamble. So it's a periodic sequence of pulses. This is not randomized. It cannot be because the car needs to detect the signal. And then once it finds the time, let's say one meter, it will fix a window, very short window uh, around the post where it will go and try to decode the NP data. And you could see here, this is the NP data, uh, which comes in a random way. So uh, one, zero, one, zero, and so on. Okay. Now you say, okay, this is, there is no attacker. This works, we measure the distance. Now, what could the attacker do in order to shorten the distance between the, the genuine user and the car? Okay. The attacker will try to position himself close to the car and he will try to uh, actually uh, 
find a way to compromise the response. How he would do that, uh, he would have first to send its own preamble, um, which is this red signal here, uh, in front of the genuine blue signal coming from the key fob. Why? Because by putting its preamble uh, before, the car would synchronize to this red signal and it will be able to measure shorter distance. Okay. But then, and then what happens is that the original key fob is 10 meters away, right? Uh, the attacker sends his own preamble uh, here, the red signal, and then the car would the car would actually synchronize to this red signal and it will measure one meter. But then what the, the attacker doesn't know, it does not know what this NP logic sequence is. It's a random sequence of zero and ones. And then the attacker would have to guess each of these bits uh, at the moment of time of one meter. It means that uh, the attacker would need to guess all the random bits uh, at one meter distance from the car, such that the car can correctly decode the signal. Okay, and this gives the probability of, su of success of uh, of the attacker, which is two to the power of n, and the n is the number of bits. And it allows um, to to actually bring the the performance the, the, of the the attack success to a two to the power of n uh, guessing probability. And here you see the attacker starts, okay, uh, the genuine zero from the car is this blue one, the attacker guess one. Oh, this is not correct. Here, the attacker also makes a random guess at one meter distance, but oh, it turns out that it's not the correct one either. Here, he's correct. The, his guess on the red signal at one meter is correct, and he's also correct. So in that case, he was able on average to guess 50% of the process, but this is absolutely not sufficient to actually effectively shorten the distance, so the car would actually reject his message. Okay, so this actually shows that um, uh, uh, a single pulse per bit system with very short pulses of two to three nanoseconds give you really strong security guarantees against uh, compromising. Uh, distance measurement uh, by, by a third party as an attacker in that case. Okay, so uh, what we have done in the past years together also a collaboration with ETH in Zurich, uh, very strong collaboration, we are able to introduce uh, these concepts of distance bounding uh, on the logical layer and on the physical layer with specific uh, post keys in order to provide to provide formally proven resilience against strong attackers. And here there were a set of, a set of papers, um, which uh, I provide for your reference of how actually distance bounding protocols work and what is the cost of distance commitment in order to ensure secure ranging. And we have now brought that in the 154Z ultra wide band standard in LRP mode. Uh, on the other side, I want to give a little bit the perspective of, uh, of, uh, of other modes in ultra wideband. There is what is called HRP mode. It was uh, promoted by some other companies. They also introduced some concepts in the standard on how to uh, sort of provide secure ranging. But they did not define the uh, RX parameters. They did not define the security pro properties. They did not define the security levels. There is no publicly available information. So at the end, the security claims that they wanted to bring in the standard had to be rejected because uh, they were, the system was not specified. And there will be soon first academic publications. Actually, I know of one which was submitted already by ETH in Zurich a couple of weeks ago on showing how such concepts which were put in the standard without definitions are actually cannot be made secure at all. And there are all types of attacks independent of how you, uh, you try to implement your system. So uh, the key point here is that uh, we do have now in 2021, a standard for secure ranging with well-defined uh, properties 
to for anyone who would like to implement uh, uh, it can use the standard and the guidance inside the standard to make a uh, secure ranging using for the ultra wide band especially in low rate cross mode okay but as i said uh, there are other modes which are either not secure or they cannot be made secure so this you need to be aware of that okay so now you can is there any practical deployments uh, since 2019 uh, there are several car models uh, which implement the low rate post mode secure engine um, uh, they use actually uh, ip from 3db and there are certain uh, semiconductor companies who are uh, uh, making chips for them and currently uh, for example the Volkswagen ID3 is the first electrical from car from Volkswagen which has uh, ultra wideband secure ranging so uh, this type of attacks that you saw at the very beginning are not possible anymore uh, you have the Golf 8 you have the Audi A3 Skoda Superb you have Seat Leon as well and as of this year you have also Mercedes S class 2021 which also incorporates uh, secure ranging in, in low rate post mode, very low power, and it's uh, one of the best systems on the market, uh, uh, also with many other security properties related to ranging. Uh, uh, so these are uh, really currently deployed uh, passive keyless entry systems for cars with uh, first secure ranging technology inside. And uh, Furthermore, I mean, there are much more applications. Uh, the car is actually the pioneer application because they, they really had a big pain, a big problem that they had to solve. But secure ranging goes much beyond that. Uh, you can imagine, for example, using secure ranging to, to open your door, like in the same way as the car. So you can have a key fob or a phone and you just uh, put your, your hand on the door or handle and your, your your door opens or you know the door can even automatically detect that you're approaching and actually open directly there were lots of scenarios also in payment uh instead of using nfc you have to take your phone or your car put it very close to the terminal you can do that in a pure passive way you keep your phone the system does arranging between the terminal and um, the and the and the phone and you can just validate by pushing a button that the transaction is okay for you for this particular amount. And there were lots of other interesting parts of, uh, of secure engine related to industrial automation, internet of things, uh, uh, people tracking, also lots of privacy and security related topics uh, that one needs to handle together. Here I also put a picture of the auto of the, um, of the, of the auto unlock from, uh, from a Mac. Uh, this is also a property where secure range can be used uh, and so on. So in general, the, having the property of proving that the two devices are close to each other has interesting application capabilities uh, around, uh, around the world. And we start now with, uh, with cars. There are already consortia like FIRA who are defining the same functions for, uh, for access control to hotels to homes, uh, also for mobile payments and so on. So the community using ultra wideband and secure engine capabilities is actually uh, starting growing up as of pretty much last year with the first introduction into cars. Uh, and now it will go forward. Hopefully in the next 10 years, we'll see much more system using secure distance measurement and engine technologies. Okay, so on that, I, complete the presentation, I want to say just a few words about 3DB. So we, we are a spin-off company from in 2012, so it's already like nine years. It took us approximately eight years to go to market. So a very long journey from the beginning to the end. Um, I mean, it's not even an end, it's we, we are first productions and we have to further develop the technology to make it more robust, uh, even more integrated, secure and so on. We have two offices, the headquarters are in Zurich. Uh, um, uh, we are pretty much uh, five people, doctoral students uh, or doctoral degree people from ETH and EPFL. And we have also an office in Povdiv, not very far from Thessaloniki, maybe, I don't know, three, 400 kilometers, uh, where we do lots of digital verification and software. In total, 15 employees, um, uh, 
uh, and we have uh, one strategic investor, which is the company Dormacabo. They are a key company and they're providing different uh, access to doors, hotels, airports, and so on. And we continue to have uh, very strong uh, uh, partnerships with the academia. It's very important for us. Uh, uh, I personally still supervise uh, three or four PhD students on various topics related to wireless security and wireless distance measurement. And uh, yeah, so that's a little bit about 3DB. I believe we are still a cool company, a small one. We, uh, if, if you think that some one of you could be interested in discovering such topics, uh, feel free to send an email. Uh, I'll be happy to discuss. Uh, we always, we will have new open positions coming on. So yeah, it's uh, uh, welcome from your side. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Danev. So that's it. And here there were separate set of references that I cited in the paper uh, in the in the presentation, such people can go and see deeper the topics. Uh, as I said, 30 minutes is a very short period of time uh, to cover uh, a huge literature, but I hope I gave you an intuition of what of what the problem is, why secure engineering is important, and what are the applications. So thank you very, very much and welcome with questions. Please, we thank you, Dr. Danev. It was Actually, indeed, it was not enough to talk about such an interesting topic. And of course, the point was to get an, a better insight into this uh, section. So, yes, I will now uh, tell you some of the questions that we have. So, the first one um, RFID and NFT are very promising technologies, but safety issues are concerning. So, do you consider them the future in financial transactions? Can we make them reliable and safe enough? So, the NSC technology or RFID, they were um, uh, they were um, uh, introduced uh, in order to. It's primarily actually to save the business of uh, credit cards like Visa. So they have this passive concept. You have to have a small chip which is passively powered by a terminal. And there the proximity guarantee is basically the difficulty, uh, basically the very close range that you need to put your card is five centimeters. So in a sense, the technology is not secure per se in terms of uh, distance measurement, but uh, because of the properties of the inductive coupling, which requires um, very close distance to actually hear the signal from the terminal, it's kind of a sort of, sort of considered very secure. One of the big problems of NEC is that it's not very convenient, especially in applications like car access. You have to take your phone, put it there. Uh, it takes time. It's also quite slow to do a transaction. So uh, uh, we, we do not expect NFC to disappear in uh, any near future. It is something which is well established and it has certain application scenarios which are which are still valid for, for that, yes. Thank you. And I move on to the next question. So is it possible that in any way someone can interfere with a normal operation of an autonomous vehicle in order to create an accident, either by mistake or by the form of attack? Uh, autonomous vehicle. So, I mean, I maybe uh, take a little bit. It's, it's a topic that we discuss a lot in the security field. We have heard lots of uh, big hype on autonomous cars. Uh, primarily from functional point of view, how you, uh, how you manage the car in different traffic scenarios. We have seen very little discussions on security. I mean, uh, here we're talking particularly about access control systems, but uh, a car is much more complex uh, system from many other points of view. And uh, uh, I can tell you that current cars which are on the market, they have actually completely unsecure communication inside the car between all the sensors. So there are, I've seen different papers with attacks on different, uh, they were able to inject packets inside the car, they're able to change features and so on. <coughs> so the security of an autonomous car is a big, big topic that needs to be handled uh, uh, in parallel to the functional behavior of the autonomous car. All right, so now I will move in another question that's regarding your experience. Um, so it's from an intern in CERN. 
uh, to the CEO of a company. So what's the difference of working in a research non-profit institution comparing with a, prof with a company producing a product? Uh, I would, uh, thank you for this question. I think um, it's... Um, it's um, I know how to say that it's... Uh, um, it, these, these two things have just nothing to do with one to the other. And uh, for me, you know, from a researcher, a doctoral degree person, to a, to a CEO where I have to handle uh, tough negotiations, primarily for money, uh, able to, to make a chip out of zero, which can do that. So for me, it was a very, very big step uh, and, uh, and a big conversion of mindset to be, to be able to uh, convert a research idea to actually selling product at the end. So the difference is very, very big, but I would say it's, uh, it's absolutely possible. And uh, it was possible because uh, at the end of your PhD, you're kind of uh, excited to see uh, if you can bring research to a product. So that's what kept me going over all these years. Thank you again for answering the question. I have another one. Uh, it's a bit more general, but uh, a man with your experience can surely help us. So uh, when you were at the start of your career, did you imagine that you would reach the place you are now? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't know what I had imagined, to be honest. I, it was a long time ago. Uh, I remember that all my business plans were absolutely wrong. I was thinking in 2012 when we started that we will be in production in 2016. Again, it turned out to be 2019, so double the time. Um, uh, at the end, I think uh, we, uh, if you ask me how did you reach that, I, I, I cannot even answer because it's a lot of uh, a lot of work, but also a lot of luck to to find the right people, to team with uh, the right companies, to further develop the product. So uh, I would say that uh, there were, there is a big luck component which needs to follow you along all this journey in order to reach to a, to a actually selling product. So of course there is lots of hard work, but there is lots of um, timing coincidences and people and partnerships which come along the line. So it's basically 50-50. You work hard, but you don't know what's gonna happen. I, I, I have to admit that uh, that was not an answer that I expected, but I can understand. Um, so another question. Yes. Um, what was your inspiration regarding the innovation that you're, you presented? I think my main inspiration uh, was the um, uh, really to see whether it is possible to take a research idea, which we, because at ETH as part of my PhD, we, we did lots of uh, wireless security. We knew we had concepts about how to do secure engine, but on paper, right? No, uh, no hardware, nothing. I think the biggest inspiration was to uh, are we able to take it to, to the market? That was the, my inspiration. And I continue having that inspiration in my, in my, uh, in my brain. So, so uh, overall, would you say it's still untrustworthy? Another question this is. Is it still untrustworthy using smart devices regarding locking doors wirelessly or other smart home devices? that would set the home in danger in any way? I think they're still untrustworthy. Uh, and there were lots of papers every year in the academic literature and security showing all kinds of vulnerabilities along the line. But uh, one, one is to understand something. It's uh, typically security is always a topic which comes after. <laughs> so uh, we try to encourage people to, to uh, uh, whenever they do any functional behavior like or application to always think about the security in parallel to that. But it's unfortunately rarely happening. Um, so uh, 
the systems are still untrustworthy, but uh, security is also a process. It takes time to actually make secure systems, learn where the vulnerabilities are, and gradually improving. If you look at the cars back in, uh, in the 80s, you know, they had only metallic keys. Then there were attacks, they introduced immobilizers to make it not possible to just copy the metallic key. Then they introduced uh, 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 other properties. So now it's significantly harder to actually compromise cars than it was 20 years ago. But it's a process that we learn over the years. And it will so, be the same thing for home automation and for other products which would appear in the market. All right. Um, I have a question that uh, someone is asking, where should he report to learn about your subject, more about your subject? Yes, uh, I, I would, um, so I think here there were on the screen already quite some references, academic papers. Uh, uh, there is also the ultra wideband standard, which has quite lots of information on, on secure engine with ultra wideband. Uh, all these papers here um, also lead to many other links. I would say that uh, interesting, uh, maybe something link I didn't put here, but I can update the presentation. There is a special website, the TTH in Zurich, which is entirely related to secure engine and secure localization. So I think it's a good website to uh, with lots of information there. Um, uh, yes, so I can update that with an additional reference here. But in general, yeah, ETH Zurich, security and uh, security, secure ranging and localization, the ultra wideband standard 2020, and these papers give you a good um, uh, view on this on this area. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that uh, whoever asked this can now uh, have a better idea of where he can search. Yes. Um, I think we can make the last question. Um, so do you think that all of these devices can be used correctly by people who are acquainted with this technology? Uh, so what, so what does it uh, mean used correctly by what, people who are... Yes, what I understand is that uh, from the point that uh, this technology is uh, progressing and it's even more common years passing by, so is it a bit dangerous? I understand that it's regarding danger. That uh, so can people use this technology corrected that do, are not aware of the of the, its power of these technology uh, assets? Well enough, is uh, it dangerous I think, enough? Yes, that people use it. Uh, so the technology is. I mean, the idea becomes secure ranging is um, is to make it transparent to the user. So the user, um, uh, the user has to have confidence that by using this technology, his assets are protected. Um, and uh, that, that was the reason that we put lots of effort in the 4Z ultra wideband standard 2020 to actually disclose all the proofs such that any person can go and educate himself. But still, uh, I, I must say that many people are skeptical, so they prefer using their conventional keys or uh, key fobs to click on a button because they believe that if something opens without their um, uh, without their uh, action, is actually not secure. It's a little bit also if you look to the contactless payments with uh, NFC cards. Many people are not using them because they 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 are scared that someone can compromise the connection, right? So, uh, in general, this is the work of the industry, the academics, to prove to the users that such systems actually are not dangerous for them. But I agree that uh, this is a step which would require also lots of time. And yeah. So, uh, Dr. Danis, this was the last question. Thank you very much, not only for presenting us, and it was very interesting, and but also answering uh, many questions. And I personally, and from all the organizing committee, we wish you all the best for the future. Thank you again for accepting the invitation. It was a pleasure and an honor. And.
So if, if you want, you could uh, see the program and watch another yes, speaker. Yes. Please let me know. Please let me know if you'd like the slides to put the on the presentation. Slides. Yes, I yes, we will. We will tell you because we saw that some of the some people of the audience were interested. Um, so I guess that this is the end of the presentation yeah. of Dr. Boris Danev. Thank you again very much. Thank you very much uh, as well. I, I wish you all the people at the conference uh, to be healthy. Uh, it was a pleasure for me as well to present this topic. It's, uh, it's a topic which is becoming uh, actually very relevant. So I, I, I believe that um, uh, it's, um, uh, it was very instructive for the people at the conference to see uh, a different aspect of life, right? So. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so again, thank you very much. We wish you all the best. Yeah, thank you very much. All the best to you and uh, and good continuation over the weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.